Hello everyone and welcome to A Plus Physics. Today we're going to talk about the ideal pendulum. Ideal pendulums provide another demonstration vehicle for simple harmonic motion. If we consider a mass M attached to a light string that swings without friction about the vertical equilibrium position, so swinging back and forth. As the mass travels along its path, energy is continuously transferred between gravitational potential energy at its higher points and kinetic energy at its lower points. The restoring force, in the case of the ideal pendulum, is provided by gravity. Now, the angular frequency of the ideal pendulum for small angles of theta is given by omega equals the square root of g, the acceleration due to gravity, divided by l, the length of the pendulum. You can then find the period of the pendulum for small angles of theta by recognizing that the period of the pendulum is equal to 2 pi divided by omega, the angular frequency, which becomes 2 pi square root L over G. So there you can get the period of an ideal pendulum. Note that the period of the pendulum depends only upon the length of the string and the acceleration due to gravity, which here on the surface of the Earth is relatively constant. There's no dependent on the mass at the end of the string whatsoever. Could be really big, could be really small. The only thing that really makes a difference is the length of the pendulum. Let's take the example of a grandfather clock. A grandfather clock is designed so that each swing or half period of the pendulum takes one second. How long is the pendulum in a grandfather clock? Well, the period of a pendulum is 2 pi square root L over G, which implies then that the length, if we solve for L, is going to end up being G times the period squared divided by 4 pi squared. We can then substitute in our variables G about 9.8 meters per second squared here on the surface of the Earth. Our total period, two seconds, if a half period is one second squared, divided by four pi squared, comes out to be mighty close to one meter, which is why pendulum clocks tend to be so tall. How about if instead we take a look at our grandfather clock if we were on the moon, where the acceleration due to gravity is roughly one-sixth that of Earth? Well, the same formula applies for the period. The period of the pendulum is two pi square root L over G, which is going to be 2 pi square root. We know our length is 1 meter. The acceleration due to gravity, though, is 1 sixth that of Earth, or 1 sixth 9.8 meters per second squared. A little bit of calculator work, and this tells me that the period of that same clock, if it were on the moon, would be 4.9 seconds. Another problem here, rank the following pendulums of uniform mass density from highest to lowest frequency. So they all have a uniform mass density, which means that the bigger we see, the larger the sphere at the end of the pendulum, the more mass it has. Thankfully, we also know mass doesn't play a difference, make a difference in the period of the pendulum. The period of the ideal pendulum depends on 2 pi square root L over G. So bigger length, bigger period. So the ones that are the shortest will have the shortest period. So it looks to me like we're going to have D first, then probably A, B, and then C. Now, if we examine the path of a pendulum at the highest point shown over here on the left, the mass is being pulled back toward its equilibrium position by gravity. We have the force of gravity, the weight, straight down, but specifically it's the component of gravity along the mass's path, which at this point it looks like it's going to be something like that if I were to draw it that way. That's going to be mg sine theta, where theta is the angle between the vertical and the current position of the string. In this position, this would be our theta. 
Now, once it gets to the bottom point, now at this point, all of that gravitational potential energy it had up here has now become kinetic energy. So it has the most kinetic energy down here and then continues up to the next point over here and back and forth and back and forth. And while we're doing that, let's take a little bit of a look at the energy considerations. If we consider our lowest point, our point where we're going to call our gravitational potential energy equals to zero, just an arbitrary reference point, then this would also be our maximum kinetic energy right there, which is going to be equal to the change in height as we go from here to here, our delta y, which means up here at our higher point, our gravitational potential energy would be mg delta y. Or what exactly is delta y? Well, that's going to be mg delta y then looks like if we do a little bit of trigonometry, if we call this length L, there's our theta, then it looks like this is going to be cos theta, L cos theta. So that whole thing will be mg L 1 minus cos theta for our change in height. How does this really play out when we explore the energy of the pendulum? Well, at the equilibrium position, the gravi gravitational potential energy is at a minimum. The kinetic energy is at a max down here, like we talked about. At the highest point, all the energy is gravitational potential energy. So using the law of conservation of energy, solving for the maximum velocity of the mass at the lowest point is pretty straightforward. We could say the kinetic energy, the maximum kinetic energy, when it's down at the lowest point, must be equal to the gravitational potential energy when it's at its highest point. Or the kinetic energy, one half mv squared, must equal mgl times one minus the cosine of theta, where l one minus the cosine of theta is actually this delta y amount right here. Little bit of algebraic rearrangement, we can solve for v to find that v, the velocity at the lowest point, the maximum velocity, is going to be the square root of 2gl times the quantity 1 minus the cosine of theta. Further, from that same graph, we can create a graph of kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and total energy as a position of the mass along the x-axis. If we're looking at the path here, here's energy on the y-axis. We have our x-axis for position here. We know that the total energy is going to remain the same, so I'm going to sketch in a line right here that shows that we have a constant total energy. Now, when we're down at this point right here, all of the energy is kinetic, so we could say that this distance is reflective of the kinetic energy. Between our total energy and our blue line is our kinetic energy. Or I could draw that up here the same way at a different position. That much is kinetic energy. Down below the line, or if we look at our maximum position right here, all the energy is gravitational potential energy. So I could draw that over here and say that is our gravitational potential energy. Now at any point, single point, the gravitational potential energy plus the kinetic must equal your total mechanical energy. That doesn't change. So the total mechanical energy remains constant throughout the entire path of the ideal pendulum. Let's take a look at a sample question here. The period of an ideal pendulum is t. If the mass of the pendulum is tripled while its length is quadrupled, what is the new period of the pendulum? Well, again, the period of an ideal pendulum is 2 pi square root L over G. Mass doesn't make any difference, so we don't care if the mass is tripled. That doesn't matter at all. But if its length is quadrupled, well, now we went from 2 pi square root L over G to 4 L over G. So really, we've multiplied the right side by square root of 4, or 2. So we'd have to put a 2 over there in order to keep that equation the same. So really what's happened is we've gone from t to 2t. What's the new period of the pendulum? Two times its original period. 
All right, let's take a look at another one. A pendulum of length 20 centimeters in mass one kilogram is displaced an angle of 10 degrees from the vertical. What is the maximum speed of the pendulum? All right, this sounds like a conservation of energy question where we looked at before and we said we could find the maximum speed of the pendulum at the lowest point by looking at the change in height of the, the ball on the pendulum, the, uh, the mass itself. And when we did that previously, we found that the velocity, the maximum velocity, was the square root of 2gl times the quantity 1 minus cosine of theta. Well, in this case, if we remembered that formula, or we could rederive it like we did previously, all we have to do is plug in our values. 2 times our acceleration due to gravity on the surface of Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared, our length of our pendulum, it tells us, is 20 centimeters, or 0.2 meters, times the quantity 1 minus the cosine of our angle, 10 degrees. And in this case, when we're talking about small angles, the smaller the angle is, the more accurate this will be. But really, if you're in the range of under 10 to 15 degrees, it's pretty reasonable estimation. So, making sure my calculator's in degree mode as I go through this, I calculate all this out to be somewhere on the order of about 0 0.24 meters per second for its maximum speed of the pendulum, and that's going to be at the lowest point. All right, hopefully that gets you a good start on ideal pendulums. Thank you so much for your time, and make it a great day, everyone.